For the past month, we've been looking at the five words that God spoke to me uh, regarding his mandate for our church for this coming year. Anybody remember the five words? Let me build my church. We don't want to build our church. We want Jesus to build his church. His church is a shrine to him, not to man-made endeavors, not to man. We, we don't want to build a shrine to a man. We want to build a shrine to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Last Tuesday, we saw that God does not dwell in temples made by hand. He did in the old covenant, but not anymore. God dwells in people. God wants to dwell in your heart. Amen. Not in a man-made structure, not in a tabernacle, not in a temple. Those things were foreshadows of what the new covenant was going to be. So uh, God dwells in people. So when Jesus said he's going to build his church, what is he building? He's building people. Everyone shout people. Now, even though Jesus is building his church, that does not mean that we don't have a part to play in it. Right? Because after all, we are his body. So he's the head. We're the body. We're the ones who are carrying out the responsibility of building the church under his leadership. Amen. Amen. But again, if we are going to build his church, what are we going to build? We're going to build people. Amen. So the title of the message tonight is Building People. Everyone shout, Building People. There is a huge pattern in the Word of God, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, where God's Word compares people to buildings. Many times, people are referred to, they're compared to buildings, compared to structures. Um, I, I told you last week that uh, the design of the tabernacle was uh, just like everything else in the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. It was a foreshadow of the New Covenant. The tabernacle had three parts. The outer court, the inner court, the holy of holies. Guess who else has three parts? We do. Spirit, soul, and body. God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The universe is time, space, and matter. Time is past, present, and future. Space is height, width, and depth. Matter is solid, gaseous, and liquid. God loves working in threes. Well, the tabernacle was, uh, was also three parts. It was an outer court, an inner court, and a holy of holies. But let me ask you, what part of the tabernacle did God dwell in? He dwelt in the holy of holies. What part of our spiritual makeup does God dwell in? He dwells in our spirit. Your spirit is your born-again nature. Your spirit was dead before you received Jesus as your Savior. But now it is alive unto God. Amen? Because you were born again. Now, uh, another name for building or another name for structure is, and this is not a word that we use very much in our, co in our common everyday vernacular, but uh, how many have ever heard of the word edifice? A building or a structure is an edifice. Well, that's an interesting word because the word edify and the word edification is used many times in, in Scripture. So when you edify something, what are you doing? You are building something. You're building it up. When you are uh, creating an, an edifice or when you are edifying something, you are engaging in edification. All right? Well, when you are building a person up, you are edifying a person. You are, you are engaging in the act of edification. You're creating an edifice. You're creating a building. So what I want to do tonight, uh, I want to take a look at the word edify, and I want to see if we can learn some things about how to build people. Uh, Romans chapter 14, verse 19, Paul says this. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. So two things in this verse. Pursue the things that make for peace and pursue the things that will help us build up each other. Pursue the things that will help us build 
people. Folks, if it doesn't bring peace, and if it doesn't build up your brothers and sisters, don't pursue it. Pursue the things that bring peace to the body of Christ and pursue the things that are going to build each other up. Now, what is, what is the first word in this verse? Therefore. When I was in Bible college, they told us that whenever you are reading the Bible and you see the word therefore, you need to find out what it's there for. Right? Because therefore points to something that was said before it. Right? There was a point made, therefore, since we've made this point, let us pursue the things that make for peace and the things that edify one another. So, let's go back a few verses and find out what the therefore is there for. We're going to start in verse 13. And it also says, therefore, <laughs> therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or a cause to fall in our brother's way. Paul says this, I know and I am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. So kingdom living is supposed to be full of righteousness. It's supposed to be full of peace. And it's supposed to be full of joy in the Holy Spirit. If what you are doing is not contributing towards righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit, then you're not walking in love. This is what he's saying. Paul is talking about the fact that there are some people in the church who are weak in faith. There are some people that might be offended by certain things that you do, even though those things that you're doing actually aren't unclean. But to them, it is unclean because... They don't understand, they haven't been taught, they haven't grown in their faith. We no longer live under the kosher laws of the Old Testament. We don't live under those laws anymore. Jesus became the fulfillment of the law. Those laws were foreshadows of things in the New Covenant. They were representative, they were metaphorical, but we don't live under kosher laws in the New Covenant anymore. But there are some Christians who don't realize, either because they haven't been taught or because they refuse to acknowledge it, they don't realize that Jesus became the fulfillment of the law. And so there are some Christians, New Testament believers, who still live under some of those Old Testament kosher laws. So they might be offended if you eat something around them that, can, that they consider to be unclean. Paul is saying that we shouldn't do anything that will cause another brother to stumble. Don't do anything. Whether you have the freedom to do it or not, that's not the point. Don't do anything around your brother that's going to cause him to stumble. It, it doesn't matter that we know that there's nothing unclean. If what we do offends somebody else, then we're not walking in the love of Christ. So don't do it. Why? Because you're hindering their ability to be built up. And we're here to do what? Build people. Right? Next verse. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Well, see, you are already accepted by God. Right? But not every single one of us is approved by every single person. There are some people who do not approve of you for whatever reason. But if you serve Christ in these things, that's acceptable to God and it's approved by men. It allows you to have an inroad to people who might otherwise be offended by you. Therefore, let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which we may edify each other. In other words, let's just pursue the things that build each other up. 
and let's leave those other things alone while we're building up our brothers and our sisters. Leave those other things alone. If it's going to offend your, your brother or sister, if it's, if, it's, if it's going to become a stumbling block in their walk, if it's going to hinder their ability to receive the anointing that you walk in, don't engage in it. Don't do anything that will hinder your ability to build your brothers and sisters up. We all on the same page? It's quiet tonight. Verse 20. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for the man who eats with offense. It is good neither to eat meat nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. So what's he saying here? He's saying if your brother is weak and he's easily offended by certain things, don't do those things around him. Instead, let's build each other up. Let's build your brother and your sister up. Let's let your brother or sister grow and they'll eventually get to the place that those things won't offend them. Amen. They'll eventually learn. They're not going to stay stagnant, but they won't learn anything if you offend them along the way and cause them to trip and stumble. You follow what he's saying here? Look at it this way. If what you do offends them, how are they ever going to listen to the gospel that you're trying to present to them? Right? The ultimate goal here is to build up people. We're here to build people. And you can't do that if your freedom in Christ is a stumbling block to their weak faith. And yes, their faith is weak. There's, there's no doubt that their faith is weak. If their faith was strong, then they wouldn't put all of this emphasis on things that really don't matter. Like what kind of food you eat. Your right standing with God has nothing to do with whether or not you eat ham. Right? Because ham is a pork product. Can't eat pork under the Old Testament law. Your right standing with God is by faith. Amen. So yes, their faith is weak. So let's say, for example, you love ham and you love bacon and you love shrimp. Because shrimp is also not kosher. Did you know that? You know what else is not kosher? You can't mix meats together under kosher law. If you go to Israel and you order a pizza, you can get a pizza with cheese on it, but you can't have cheese and meat because you can't mix the two together. Or if you don't have any cheese, you can put meat on it, but you can only put one kind of meat on it because you can't mix different kinds of meat together. And none of that meat can be pork. Yesterday, we were coming back from Orlando and we were trying to figure out where we, where we were gonna have lunch. And Jessica found this restaurant in Orlando. She had eaten at one of these places in uh, Nashville. It's called Maple Street Biscuit Company. If, you have ever been to, if you've never been to a, a Maple Street Biscuit Company and you ever come across one, I highly recommend it. So the, all of their dishes are made with buttermilk biscuits. So yesterday I had a piece of uh, boneless uh, fried chicken breast and an egg and a slice of cheese and bacon on a buttermilk biscuit smothered in sausage gravy. I broke like 16 kosher laws with this meal, okay? And it was so good. <laughs> Dang, that was good. <laughs> but look, if you like ham and you like bacon and you like shrimp and your weaker brother or sister thinks that those things are unlawful according to scripture, then don't eat ham, bacon, and shrimp around them. Just continue to pursue the things that will build them up. Right? Eventually, they're going to grow. They're going to understand. They're going to... They're, they're going to grow in their faith. They're going to learn how the kingdom works. They're going to learn how God's word works. And before you know it, you're going to be eating bacon-wrapped shrimp with them while going to church on a Saturday after sundown. Because that's another one that people get caught up on, right? 
You know, is the, is the, sun, is, uh, is the Sabbath on a Sunday or is it on a Saturday? Uh, there's a, a person who goes to this church who has uh, some family members who are Seventh-day Adventists. And uh, she was telling them, you know, uh, we go to church on Saturday and they go, oh, oh you're, you're, you're going to church on the Sabbath. What time's your church service? 6 p.m.? Oh, you're almost on the Sabbath <laughs> because the Sabbath, uh, uh, the Sabbath ends at sundown. So, but look, folks, <laughs> I've told you this many times. We don't live under a Saturday Sabbath. We don't live under a Sunday Sabbath. We do not live under a once a week Sabbath. We live under a perpetual Sabbath because Jesus is our Sabbath. Amen. But see, a person like that who has limited understanding of the kingdom, I'm not going to get into an argument with them about the Sabbath. Why? Because I want to pursue the things that make peace and pursue the things that will build them up. If, if they're following the leading and the direction and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, they will eventually grow out of their legalism. Amen? Now... So far, we've been reading this chapter backwards, <laughs> but I'm going to go backwards again. <clears throat> Let's go to the beginning of Romans chapter 14. Let's start in verse 1. Paul says this, Accept the one who is, whose faith is weak, without quarreling over disputable matters. One person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another whose faith is weak eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does. For God has accepted them. Who are you to judge someone else's servant? To their own master, servants stand or fall. And they will stand, for the Lord is able to make them stand. So in verse 1, Paul says... Don't quarrel over disputable matters. Well, the first thing that that tells me is that there are things in Scripture that are disputable. There are verses in Scripture, principles in Scripture that can be interpreted one way or interpreted another way, depending on which uh, way that you're looking at that Scripture. But there are other things in Scripture that are indisputable. Salvation by grace through faith is indisputable. Amen. Jesus is the only way to the Father. That is indisputable. Amen. There's only one way to the Father. There's only one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus. Amen. That's indisputable. There are many things in the Bible that are indisputable. There are not multiple paths to God. There's one way to God. That's indisputable. But... Whether or not women are scripturally required to wear hats to church, that's disputable. There are a lot of churches, modern day, New Testament churches, who require women to wear hats to church because of a scripture that says that women should have their head covered. Well, I'm not going to get into an argument with somebody over that topic because it's disputable. If you're saved by faith in Jesus Christ, that's something we can agree on. Let's focus on what we can agree on so that we both can grow in our faith. Let's not throw out stumbling blocks for each other. Next verse, verse 5. One person considers one day more sacred than another. Another person considers every day alike. Each of them should be fully convinced in their own mind. Whoever regards one day as special does so to the Lord. Whoever eats meat does so to the Lord, for they give thanks to God. And whoever abstains from eating meat does so to the Lord and gives thanks to God. You know, it's the Christmas season, so this is a perfect time to talk about this verse. You know, many people treat Christmas in many different ways, right? Many people celebrate Christmas in many different ways. About 20 years ago, I met a pastor who absolutely refused to exchange Christmas presents. He would not buy Christmas presents. His family didn't give Christmas presents. 
He didn't like to receive Christmas presents. And I asked him about it, and he, he said this. He goes, I am certain that the Savior of mankind never intended for us to celebrate his birthday by showering each other in gifts and greed. <clears throat> well, that was his perspective, and I understand where he's coming from. But I'll say this. For one thing, Jesus wasn't even born in December. So if you really want to get down to brass tacks, we're really not celebrating his birthday in the first place because his birthday happened probably in April. Remember, uh, Joseph and Mary, they were going to Bethlehem for taxation and for the census. That, that occurred in the spring. They, they didn't do this in, in December. But even so, since when is giving gifts to each other a bad thing? Doesn't the Bible say give and it will be given unto you? Yep. Isn't giving a good thing? Amen. Now, I realize people, <clears throat> they can take it too far. I realize that uh, the commercialization of Christmas can get blown out of proportion. But I just want to say this. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Right. right? Christmas is a good thing. Giving gifts is a good thing. <clears throat> Years ago... I worked for a church, and uh, our, our church board consisted of three couples, husbands and wives. And one of the board members' wives, one of the ladies, she refused to put up Christmas trees. <clears throat> she said, if you look up the origin of where Christmas trees come from, Christmas trees are pagan. And you know what? She's right. They are. That's, that's the origin of where Christmas trees come from. It's not a Christian exercise. It came from the Druids, I think. But uh, it's, it's, it's not a Christian. It, 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 does, it does not originate in Christianity. But Paul just said, one person considers one day to be holy, another person considers that day to be just like any other day. And then what did he say? Each person should be convinced in their own mind. In other, in other words, a thing is what you say it is. Christmas trees are what you say a Christmas tree is. Not what somebody else 1,500 years ago said a Christmas tree is. To me, when I put up a Christmas tree, I see the evergreen, and I rem I'm reminded of everlasting life. I see lights, and I'm reminded that Jesus is the light of the world. Amen. Right? I see the tree and I re I'm reminded where Jesus said, I'm the vine and you're my branches. There's a lot of symbolism that you can apply to a Christmas tree if you choose to do so. Amen. A thing is what you say it is. Amen? Amen. Who has the authority? You do. So <laughs> you can call it whatever you want to call it. You have the authority to do so. And so this one board member's wife, uh, she... Uh, she never put up Christmas trees. And so the pastor of the church, or the pastor's wife, sat down and had a conversation with her from this verse and said, look, I mean, a thing is whatever you say it is. So don't get caught up in all of this legalism and saying that uh, it's evil for anybody in the church to have a, 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 a Christmas tree. You're throwing stumbling blocks out to people. Pursue the things that bring peace and, and set yourself free from legalism. Amen. So Paul is basically saying here that whatever you do, do it under the Lord. If you eat meat, eat meat under the Lord. If you abstain from eating meat, do it under the Lord. If you consider one day to be holy, consider it holy under the Lord. If you choose not to celebrate that particular holiday, do it under the Lord. Each person should be convinced in their own mind what it is. If you consider a Christmas tree to be pagan, then it is only to you. If you consider eating Christmas ham to be unholy because pork is unclean, well, then it is, but only to you. If you consider giving Christmas presents to be too commercialized, well, then they are to you. But don't throw that out as a stumbling block for other people. Amen? 
There are some Christians who don't celebrate Christmas largely due to the fact that they weren't brought up in a household that celebrated Christmas. You know, your childhood really forms a lot of your opinions and the things that you do in life. Amen? You know, my, when I was growing up, my family, Christmas was a huge thing in our household. And so now I'm 47 years old and I love Christmas. I love the decorations. I love the lights. I love shopping for presents. I love the music. I love the movies. I love the food. I love the food. Did I say food twice? Uh, I love spending time with my family. I love putting up the tree. I love the food. I love receiving presents. I love Christmas cookies. That falls under the food too. I love it all. Amen? When I was a kid, my dad was a pilot for a gas company. He patrolled natural gas pipelines. And we lived in Detroit, Michigan. And dad's job took him once a week. He had to fly from Detroit, Michigan to Bloomfield, Iowa. Well, it just so happens Bloomfield, Iowa is the town that I was born in. And all of my family is from Bloomfield, Iowa. All of my aunts, my uncles, my cousins. And so every year uh, at Christmas time, Dad's job took him to Iowa anyway, so we would just jump on the airplane with Dad and we would fly down to, to Iowa and have Christmas with all of our family. And we had cousins and aunts and uncles and we would go sledding and we would have uh, parties and we'd have food and we would play games and we'd watch movies. It was like being Puerto Rican, but the food isn't as flavorful, <clears throat> okay? But that's the way I was raised. Christmas for me brings up so many wonderful childhood memories and nostalgia. But I, I know other people who will say, you know, when I was a kid, Christmas was just another occasion for my parents to let me down. And that's the way some people grew up, you know? Some people grew up in a place where they couldn't afford Christmas. So I understand that too. And I'm gonna say something that you probably won't hear a lot of pastors say. I love the song, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, just as much as I love Silent Night. <laughs> Pastor, that's blasphemy. People always say, well, you know, don't forget the reason for the season. Well, Jesus is the reason for the season, but I also want to point this out. A lot of people say, don't forget the reason for the season, because Christmas and Easter are the only times they even think about Jesus with any sincerity. I celebrate Jesus all year long. Amen. What, what, we just talked about this last Saturday. I pick up my cross daily. Amen. I pick up the kingdom daily. Yes. I, I'm not just picking it up on Christmas and Easter. Amen. I celebrate Christmas every day of my life. I celebrate Easter every day of my life. I celebrate the resurrection every day of my life. I pick up my cross every day of my life because Jesus told me to. But you know what I don't do every day of my life? I don't listen to Bing Crosby. I don't put up a toy train. I don't watch Charlie Brown while eating a sugar cookie. I do that around Christmas. So that's what Christmas is to me. Amen? Now it may be different for you. And that's completely okay. As long as you're doing what Paul said. As long as you're convinced in your own mind that whatever you're doing, you're doing unto the Lord. Right? So I don't want to get into any kind of an argument or, uh, or, or any kind of theological debate with anybody over disputable matters. I don't want to throw out stumbling blocks. I want to pursue the things that make peace, and I want to pursue the things that edify each other. Amen? That's the biggest point that Paul is making in this passage. We should not allow our freedom in Christ to become a stumbling block to our brother. If we do so, we're not building up the church. And our, our job here is to build people. Amen? If, we, if we're throwing out stumbling blocks, we're not operating in love. So pursue only those things which make for peace and pursue only those things which build up your brother. That's how you build the church, by building people. Amen? We're going to talk more about this next Tuesday. I'm really looking forward to sharing some other things about building people. But if we're going to build the church, if Jesus is going to build his church through us, 
He's going to build people through us. Amen? And if we're going to build people, the only way we can do it is by not allowing disputable things to become a hindrance in our uh, attempt to build up other people. Don't throw out stumbling blocks. Amen? All right. Hi, I'm Heath. And I'm Louise. And we want to thank you so much for watching this video. Faith Life Worship Center in Naples, Florida is a Bible-believing, spirit-filled, non-denominational church. If you live in Southwest Florida and you're looking for a good church with a fun and energetic contemporary worship experience, awesome children and youth ministries, and a great family atmosphere, we'd love to see you at one of our services really soon. Go to faithlifeworshipcenter.com to learn more about our church, watch other messages online, check out our store, or support our ministry financially. Please take a few seconds to like this video and subscribe to our channel. You can also find us on social media. We hope that you'll watch other messages online, but what we really want is to see you in person at Faith Life Worship Center. Hope to see you soon. Bye. Bye.